Shalom. Today we're continuing on our series Signs in the Heavens, showing how the uh, astronomical signs of each month, the signs that are on the ecliptic, sometimes uh, associated with astrological signs, how those signs line up with the months, the Hebrew months. Today we're moving to the second month, which has uh, several names, a, a biblical name and the common name in Israel. So the biblical name is Ziv, and we see it here in 1 Kings 6, 1, and it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziv, which is the second month that he began to build the house of Yahweh. I have no idea why they transliterate this with an F, but uh, it is a Vav and is pronounced Ziv. Uh, in verse 37, in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of Yahweh in the month of Ziv. Ziv comes from a, a biblical Hebrew root, which is also pronounced Ziv. It's a later use in the book of Daniel. We see it uh, in Daniel 2, 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. So Ziv means brightness. Daniel 4.36 At the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness returned to me, and my counselors and my law, lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. So we imagine uh, right about this time of year that the sun begins to become brighter and the flowers are blooming and that brightens the landscape and this is the idea of Ziv. I actually learned this word Ziv many years ago. It appears in a song by Ofra Haza and I've put uh, links for two different recordings of the song. In the older recording she sings it with more of an Israeli accent. In the uh, second recording, you can hear her use a more Yemenite accent, which was her uh, natural ancestry. So there are many times where we would say a vav and we would say va, and you're going to hear her say wa because that is how it's pronounced. Also, um, the gal gal, the, the wheels, and the song is based on Ezekiel's vision, wheels within the wheels, where we would say gal gal, and she does say in the first recording gal gal, in the second recording you're going to hear her say jal jal. So that's just a little side note for those of you that are interested in Hebrew. Now, uh, in modern Hebrew, this month, the second month, is called er, and it comes from the root light. So again, we have this idea of the, the light of day is increasing, the brightness of the landscape. And I know you know the root of this word, or. Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Job 24, 13, they are of those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the paths thereof. Psalm 27, 1, Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Also in a maybe less literal sense, in a simile kind of a sense, we see Isaiah 9.1, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath light shined. Speaking of the fact that the Messiah is ministering in that area. Proverbs 16:15 In the light of the king's countenance is life and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. So we talk about people's face being light maybe because they're happy or they're shiny or there's wisdom involved there. Now something very important takes place in the second month and uh, we see in Numbers 9:11 the 14th day of the second month that even they shall eat it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. There's a commandment 
uh, that if you miss Passover, you have another chance to do it in the second month. Passover is in the first month, 14th day, and we're going to talk more about the parameters of this in a minute. But you always have the option to do it the second month. And we see that at the time of Hezekiah, there was a commandment to do it in the second month. Second Chronicles 30, verse 2. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month, a very great congregation. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burst offerings into the house of Yahweh. So it was a commandment in Numbers. We'll talk about it more in a minute, but we see that it was actually practiced um, during the time of Hezekiah as uh, narrated in Second Chronicles. Some other things that happened in the second month uh, over the course of history, number 118, and they assembled all the congregation on the first day of the second month, and they declared their pedigrees after their families by the house of their fathers, according to the number of their names from 20 years old and upward by their poles. So this is a declaration of showing uh, what the family line is, that they belong to the family of the Israelites. Uh, also, in Numbers 10, 11, and it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of testimony. So throughout the book of Numbers, the people are wandering, and this is just one instance. They had celebrated Passover, remember, in the previous month, and we see that even as it happens, they're going to have to celebrate in Numbers 9, the second Passover, the tabernacle is not going to be moved because the cloud is not taken up until the 20th day of the month. So they have time to complete that festival before they're going to move on. So it happens that the uh, sign, the astronomical sign, during this month is the sign of Taurus, the bull. Uh, interesting because the Taurus, the bull, is also a sacrificial animal. The word in Hebrew is shor, and uh, the, the tor, we can hear even in Spanish, we know that the bull is toro. This is a Latin root with a t instead of the Hebrew sh, but this is a, a cognate word. It's a common migration, the sound of sh, shin, moving to tav. Uh, for example, in Hebrew, the word for three is shalosh. Sh, la, sh, shalosh, and in Arabic it's talata, and so we see that the the ta sound substitutes for the shin sound. So I think we can say that the word Taurus definitely comes from a Hebrew root of shor. It's variously translated Genesis thirty-two five, and I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I might find grace in thy sight. In Leviticus 4.10, as it was taken off from the bullock of the sacrifice of peace offerings, the priest burnt them upon the altar of the burnt offering. So this bull, this Taurus in the sky, is a sacrifice animal, and it's at a time of a secondary sacrifice. But that's not the only important thing. Words come from a root, Sharar, and this is a piece from Jacinius, what he has to say. And Sharar... Uh, the basic idea of sharar means to twist a rope until you're turning it into a piece of twine. It gives you all the common roots that go with it. Uh, even the word shear, the word for song, comes from this. If you think about uh, what is in your throat, what do we call those things that make the noise? We call them vocal cords because they're like a rope. They're something that's twisted. It's usually something we consider that it's under pressure. And uh, so we're going to see in a minute how that comes to relate to the bull or the ox. Um, there's some other translations in Deuteronomy 29:19, And it came to pass when he heareth the words of this curse that he bless himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart to add drunkenness to thirst. 
Um, the idea here of the imagination of the heart has something to do with being twisted so tight that it becomes stubborn and we don't change our mind. It's something of our own imagination. In Job 40, 16, I, I chose the NASB. Behold now his strength of his loins and his power is in the muscles of his belly. And this is the common word, uh, modern word in Hebrew for muscle, shrier. This is this root. And uh, I think the King James translates it as navel, which could possibly go back to the idea of another cord, the umbilical cord. Um, but I think muscles is a better idea because your umbilical cord just is not a bunch of strength in your loins, but your muscles are. So we see this muscle-bound animal, this big ox or bullock, however you translate it. He's a work animal. He's got a lot of muscles and he's uh, moving in a certain manner that uses that strength. Now the bullock becomes associated with the tribe of Ephraim through this verse. Deuteronomy 33:17. His glory is like the firstling of a bullock and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Menashe. When you see a picture of the Israelites camped in the wilderness, they're uh, in four directions, and they have four different leading tribes. And one of those tribes is the leader, leading tribe is Ephraim. And we see also that flags are associated with those four corners, that's a whole study, very interesting study in itself. Maybe at some point uh, I'll do a, a PowerPoint on that. But in the meantime, it's generally accepted because of this verse that the bullock represents Ephraim, and that would have been the flag over his camp. There's something else that's interesting about uh, the, an association of the bull to um to Ephraim, actually in Joseph. There is a story in the Babylonian literature in the um, Epic of Gilgamesh. And it's one of the earliest works of literature. And there's a goddess named Ishtar. And she sends this bull of heaven to kill Gilgamesh, who is the main character. Um, and the reason she wants to kill him is because he has spurned her advances. Where do we see a picture like that where the queen is trying to advance towards somebody and that young man takes off his coat and runs away, right? And that is Joseph, and Joseph is the father of Ephraim. So it's very interesting that these ideas are tied together here. The... Um, the Jewish tradition, which you can read in different places, is that Ephraim is represented by this bull. So now speaking of the second Passover, in Numbers 9-10, uh, what happened previously is that there were two fellows, I think, and they couldn't attend the Passover because they were defiled by a dead body. And they come to Moses and they want to know what they can do. Now, in, in a spiritual development in your life, Passover is extremely important. You can't go anywhere without Passover. Passover is basically your born-again experience, whatever, however you define that, whatever that means to you. Um, you can't walk any path with the Lord until you make a decision to belong to the community, or to belong to the Lord, or however you frame that in your theology. Passover is the first step. The people could not do anything. They could not go to Sinai. They could not get Torah. They could not live. They could not celebrate any feast, nothing, until they went out of Egypt. So this is very crucial, and the fact that these men couldn't celebrate the Passover. I'm not talking about the first Passover, but I'm talking about the Mikre, the uh, rehearsal, the continued celebration, which we talked about 
last month because it is a an, an ordinance forever. And so these guys were upset about this, and they went to Moses. And Moses said, you know, I don't know. I'm going to have to ask God about that. And uh, Moses came back with this ruling from the Lord. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord, and it is in the second month. So it's a beautiful picture because it gives us a reflection of the fact that we always have an opportunity to come back, to make a commitment, to decide to walk with Yahweh on this walk. Uh, so it's very important. And he gives the two, re- these are the two reasons. Those guys have been defiled by a dead body. They couldn't participate. Or if you're in a journey far away. Furthermore, the principal star in Taurus is called uh, Alderbaran, and it means in Arabic, the follower. In Arabic, you should know that the prefix al, al, means the, and you see it in some English words like algebra, that's an Arabic word, alchemy, that's an Arabic word, and it just means the and whatever follows it. So we have the idea of this Derberon is following. Now that it's called that because it rises near and soon after the Pleiades. We're going to talk about the Pleiades in a moment. Pleiades is a star group that's within the constellation Taurus. If we take off the AL, we can see a Hebrew root. And it's a root you know, Davar, which usually means to speak. However, a couple of times it appears in the Hefil Binyan, which is unusual. Usually it's in PL. And in this case, it takes a different meaning. Psalm 1847. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. Psalm 47.3. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. So speaking in a certain way where the people are become lower they become subservient and guess what that means they're going to follow the rules they're going to follow the word they're going to follow the leader so this is the main star the follower is the main star in um in taurus so here is a picture of the stars that comprise the star group which is known as the pleiades and there are basically seven on the right, and they are considered to be sisters, seven sisters. And then on the left, you have these two stars, Pleione, who is their mother, and Atlas, who is their father. It happens that Atlas also fathered another group of sisters, which is known as the Hyades, and they are also in the constellation of Taurus. So very interestingly, we have two sets of half-sisters. They have the same father, but different mothers. The Hyades, which means uh, rain, comes from the word for rain, there are five of them. The Pleiades, which can have several different meanings, one of those meanings means fullness, and there are seven of them. So uh, I don't know much about what that means, but I do know that five plus seven equals 12. And you can think about that. Two groups of half-sisters, and there's 12 of them all together. Now, the Pleiades is one of three uh, constellations that's actually mentioned in Tanakh. And the name for it is Kima in Job 9.9, which maketh Arcturus and Orion and the Pleiades and the chambers of the south, talking about the greatness of God, who has set all the stars in place and all the heavens. In Amos 5, 8, we see a different translation. Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. We said there are seven of them in the Pleiades, there are seven sisters. And turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. Yahweh is his name. 
The name Kima comes from a verb root Kama, which only appears once in Psalm uh, 63, 2, or it's actually part of verse 1 if you're reading a uh, normal Christian Bible. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longing for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. So here are these seven sisters, and they're in a dry and thirsty land, and they are longing for the Lord. We know that stars are representative of angels, and we see that very thing in Revelation 1, in verses 16 and 20. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, these are specific seven churches uh, which are about to receive letters from the Lord about uh, what they've been doing and what they haven't been doing and what their rewards will be. And these churches are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And all these churches, all these cities are in Asia Minor, was part of Turkey now. They are not in the land, they are in exile. Now the brightest of the, of the Pleiades is named Alcyon. And this word has come into English, and this is a little um, etymological survey of the word Halcyon. And Halcyon means calm, quiet, or peaceful. And there's a citation from the 1540s talking about Halcyon days. And these days reference, supposedly, 14 days of calm weather at the winter solstice. This uh, is nothing to do with Taurus. Taurus is not at that time of year. But the calm weather comes when a mythical bird, which is called the Alcyon, um, it's also identified with the kingfisher, is said to breed in a nest floating, and this is the calm part, on calm seas. Um, I imagine that it would be difficult to find a sea calm enough where a bird could sit in a nest on the sea. The name of this fabulous bird is attested in Middle English as Alcyon. It is a word of unknown origin. There is an explanation that it comes from hals, which it means uh, sea or salt, and that, that's a common uh, Germanic root for salt, hals. And then with a, a root that means to conceive or a, to swell, probably this is the idea of the bird, um, the bird's mating and, and before, the, before she lays the eggs. However, we see it is probably an ancient folk etymology to explain a loan word from a non-Indo-European language. So let me give you an example of a folk etymology. Uh, much to some people's dismay and disappointment, the word butterfly does not come from the idea of flutter by. That is a folk etymology. The word butterfly does come from two words, butter and fly, even though flutter by seems nice and it just seems like some metathesis of moving letters around, but that's not where it comes from. That's a folk etymology. Butterfly, however, is not a loan word. It's a word that came up through, through the Germanic languages. But if, if Alcyon is a loan word from a non-Indo-European language, Let's go back to Arabic and take the al, the al, off of it. Now, I have seen that uh, some people have done that, some uh, scholars from the 1800s, and said, well, Sion, that Sion part of it means uh, the center. And it was thought that this star, the Alcyon star, in Pleiades was the center of the galaxy and that seemed very brilliant to them in the 1800s of course since then they have found out that it's not true but you can hear yourself Al Sion you can think about what that is 
Here's our nice kingfisher bird, and he pretties striped in blue and white. What does that sound like? Al Sion. Jeremiah 31 6. For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, let us go up to Zion unto Yahweh our God. Jeremiah 50 verses 4 and 5. In those days, and in that time, saith Yahweh, the children of Israel shall come, and they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek Yahweh their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come and let us join ourselves to Yahweh in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. So here comes the second Passover. Here comes Ephraim. He's been out in the nations. He's seeking the way to Zion. He's been defiled either by a dead body or from being far away. But now he's ready to participate in the second Passover. Next month is another month. And if we're still here, which I assume we will be, uh, and still waiting, in the meantime, keep your eyes on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Tasimitai naim al-hashamayim. Shalom, shalom.